Cannabis Week on PM. Our home editor, Mark Easton, is here. Cannabis is illegal, so what do we know about its use? Well, um, it is easily the most commonly used illicit drug in Britain. Um, The the latest figures suggest that the proportion of adults uh, who used cannabis in the last year, this is England and Wales, has fallen from about 11% in 2003 down to about 7%, 6 6.6% in the the latest figures, which means we're we're on a par with uh, use in places like Holland and Denmark, a little below France and Spain. They use a bit more there, and the Czech Republic has a lot of use. But we're a bit above Germany, Italy, Portugal, most of Scandinavia. So it appears that, well, we're not unusual in our use of marijuana. But there was actually there were some interesting figures done a couple of years ago in which the, um, when you go to a police station now, you can be tested to see whether you test positive for drugs. And the Home Office did four little pilots around the country to look and see what proportion of those people arrested at a police station tested positive for cannabis. And I can tell you, in Sunderland... It was 54% of people tested positive. Uh, In South Norwood, it was 49%. Now, you mentioned the police. What does the law tell us? Well, of course, cannabis possession is uh, a crime. Um, 160,000 people a year are given a formal police warning uh, for possession. Um, So, you know, that's that's actually a serious penalty. Uh, uh, Only a few hundred are jailed for cannabis possession, but many people would say that that's uh, that's too many anyway. The maximum penalty for possession, just so you know, is five years in prison or unlimited fine or both. If you supply someone else or you grow cannabis, the maximum sentence increases to 14 years. Now, of course, this whole question about the legal status of cannabis has been discussed for a long time. If you go back to the days of flower power and Woodstock in 1969, uh, we do know American attitudes from that time. Uh, Just 12% of Americans in 1969 thought it should be legalised. Today, a slim majority think it should be legal. And actually, it's a similar tale here in the UK. A survey in 2013 found 53% of people in Britain want cannabis legalised or decriminalised. And given that only 30% of people say they've ever actually tried cannabis, that's interesting because it means a significant proportion who've never used it uh, would still like to see it uh, decriminalised or legalised. And where do politicians stand on that? Well, the situation at the moment is that uh, David Cameron uh, has said he doesn't support the decriminalisation of any drugs that are currently illegal. Um, But there are some voices within the Conservative fold. The think tank Bright Blue has recommended reform of cannabis laws. Uh, Labour, well, Ed Miliband, same. He says he believes that decriminalisation or legalisation of cannabis would send out the wrong signal, in his words. The Liberal Democrats, of course, long history of wanting uh, more liberal drugs laws. Nick Clegg has called for a royal commission to look at alternatives to prohibition for all drugs, including cannabis. Uh, The Greens would decriminalise cannabis. UKIP wouldn't, although Nigel Farage has made encouraging noises about the um, the Portuguese model you may be discussing this week, where, where all drugs have been dec- decriminalised. What appears to be the case is that once you leave office, uh, you become much more likely to uh, to, 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 to uh, favour an alternative to prohibition. Even David Cameron, who once uh, called for, for us to look at alternatives to prohibition and said it was disappointing if radical options on the law on cannabis weren't looked at. Mark Easton, thank you. Throughout the week, you will hear a variety of experiences and views on PM. Uh, You can catch up with last night's on our Twitter account. Someone who's used cannabis for several years is Clark French. He's 29, and his relationship with the drug had unorthodox beginnings. I had a lot of experience with it because my late stepfather, Richard, he, he, he was an MS patient, and unfortunately he's not with us anymore. Um, But I grew up around seeing him medicating with cannabis. You know, at school they tell you, you know, drugs are bad. They give you no real reason for that, apart from massive scare stories about how it's going to cause you to go crazy. But my experience was the complete opposite of that. I grew up around seeing it drastically, drastically help someone, you know, someone that's very dear to my heart. Um, And as a child... um, it's pretty difficult having a parent who has primary progressive MS, but I saw it help. You know, I saw it. You can't, you can't not be aware that it's helping when someone is so ill that they can't even hold their head up, and they go out and they you, you know, they medicate with cannabis, and then they come back and then they can have a conversation with you when you, you, you know, you normally can't do that. It's kind of like shockingly apparent that it helps. Did you think, as you became a little bit older, that this 
thing which transformed your stepfather and and his life did you think about it recreationally oh well i now that i look back um i would say that uh it's a it's difficult to say what is and what isn't recreational cannabis use because well uh, my stepfather died when i was 11 it was very difficult Mm. and i've struggled with that um so i think that i've had uh every single uh piece of cannabis that I've ever used has been in my opinion medicine for me because it's really it really helped me deal with that and it really helped me um, generally like even before I had MS I've suffered from quite a lot of depression and problems in regards to that and and it's really 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 helped. Um, Can you be sure the cannabis had no link in causing your depression? um, Well I think that you know we're talking about something that a lot of people maybe the you know the scare stories are that cannabis is going to cause the depression or whatever but actually you know as i said losing a parent at 11 years old yeah i think that might have a little bit more to do with it um and and you know you do the research and you look into it and actually you find that there is a lot of use around cannabis for not just depression but many many different illnesses and ailments and it was a great help to you as a young teenager getting over trying to get over the, the death of richard yes definitely it helped a lot. Now tell me about how cannabis and using it has gone from something recreational into something that you consider much more necessary. I suppose this is a question about your health. In 2010, I was myself diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, so it's, been, it's pretty much the bane of my life. What on earth was that like? I mean, you watched Richard die. Mm. Getting that diagnosis, at, in, I mean, you're, you're in your 20s, for heaven's sake. Yeah. Um <laughs> can't really put it into words how much um my life has changed and how much i'm just not the person who i used to be so i was like really really busy really active really outgoing um you know it, it just took that from me completely and physically what was happening to you that prevented you from doing these things um well kind of first started where i would i was walking from my halls to the shop and um i just collapsed and my legs just stopped working. I was like, and the severe like pains, like it just felt like a electric pins and needles burning sensation, just building up and like building up and building up and building up to the point where I just had to, I you know, I fell over in agony, was screaming, and yeah, it was, it was awful. And then from that moment, I had a lot of a lot of pain, I, uh, night spasms uh, where I just get the intense cramps. Um, I have a thing called MS Hug, and it basically is a tight uh, banding around my chest, which basically feels like I'm being stabbed in the side every single moment of every single day. That's not gone away. Like Most of my symptoms uh, will come and go, um, but the MS Hug is one that I live with every single day. Have you had them during this interview while we've been talking? I have them right this second, yeah. Can Always. You des- can you describe? I know it's a, f- a very familiar feeling to you. What's it feel um, like? Okay, so it start. I'll start in my feet. Um, the bottom of my feet feel like tingly, uh, like a slightly pins and needles dead, uh, but not not quite. Um, and then into my, my big toes, like really uh, kind of a bit fiery, uh, a bit worse than the rest of my feet today. Uh, you go up to my ankles, and my ankles are really achy, like uh, really like right deep into the bone. Uh, my calf muscles, uh, they they're like. You know that lactic acid feeling when you've gone for a really long run mm. and you've got back and you've like you've sat down and your legs just going Psh! like kind of like beating with your heart throbbing and it's like it's kind of like that. And so I've got that there. That's going up into my calves really badly. It's actually worse in my calves than in, in my thighs. Sorry, than in my calves. Uh, then we go up to my chest on on the right side of my chest. I have intense uh, stabbing pains. It actually feels like I have a knife stabbed in me right now um my shoulders hurt my neck hurts my back hurts everything hurts does anything not hurt my face doesn't really hurt a lot and the back of my ear around my by my ears and the left side left side of my chest doesn't really hurt but that's it so we come to the question of medication what does Mm. what is medical science what can the nhs offer you to alleviate your pain, uh, help you become more mobile? What is there? Mm. Well, when I was first diagnosed, I was offered a drug called Tysabri. And Tysabri is a disease-modifying treatment. 
costs the NHS £21,000 a year and it apparently will stop me having more relapses as I go later on in life. Um, but it has some very serious potential side effects. I mean, obviously there are side effects that don't happen to everyone, but it could happen to some. And one of them is to go into a coma that you will never wake up from. So at 24 years old, I was not ready. I was not ready to take that step. I'm, I mean, MS is awful, but... You know, I, I like life and I want to live. Like, I really want to be alive and, and be present and part of this world. So um, not that drug then? So I decided to not go with that drug. Um, and then for, for pain, my main port of call is tramadol. So I'm still pre prescribed tramadol and I've got a box of it at home, but uh, just in case, but I, I don't ever really use that. Why um, not? Because with tramadol, the thing is that I cannot be myself. It's so intense. Um... Well, it's, you know, it's synthetic morphine. It's basically, the doctor will give me what is cl very close to heroin, but not medical cannabis. It seems absurd, really. Um, but that's not it. So many different options that I've been been asked to try, and I have tried a lot of them as well, but overall, just none, not a single one of them has done what cannabis does for me. And in terms of your pain, yeah, what does taking the cannabis do for you? A lot. It really varies from day to day. Um, so I can say on, on the worst ever days, um, it does actually reduce it a lot. Um, so, some days it doesn't do quite as much as other days. But in general, I would say if I'm at a pain level of, let's just pick a number eight, if I'm at a pain level of an eight out of ten, like quite, quite bad, um, probably about a five today, um, if I'm at an eight, I can consume cannabis, especially if it's concentrated in oils. I can consume cannabis and it will go right down to a two or a three. So it doesn't take it away completely, but it makes a big difference, really big difference. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that, that this cannabis you're taking, you're, you know, it's illegal. You're, you're breaking the law. Mm. I am breaking the law, but when it comes to... You know, I'm faced with a decision every single day. I'm faced with a decision. What do I do? Do I be an ordinary citizen and uphold the law and be unwell and have more pain from my MS and live a worse quality of life? Or do I say, well, actually, no, this law is unjust and I'm going to break the law because my health is more important to me than a law which is based in nothing but stigma. But you were using cannabis before you had MS. Yeah, I was. Um, but again, I ha I've had depression and I was a, a, was a patient there. Just, you know, I don't want to be a criminal. I'm trying my best to actually tra change this law so that I'm not criminalised and so that, I, so that nobody is criminalised for this. What about other drug alternatives on the NHS or, I don't know, synthetic cannabis you hear about? Is there anything uh, legal that could give you the sort of benefits that you enjoy? Yeah, there there is, um, and it's called Sativex. So the government licensed GW Pharmaceuticals to grow, I think it's something like 30,000 tonnes worth of cannabis every single year. They then uh, make it into a tincture, so they uh, take off the essential ingredients, the cannabinoids, which is the medicine, they make it into an oil, and then they put that back into a little bottle with a bit of mint flavouring and some other alcohol, which you spray under your tongue. Uh, but they they try and say, oh, you know, Sativex primarily consists of THC and CBD, but it's actually a full plant extract. So you get the range of different cannabinoids that are, that are in the cannabis plant in that product. Um, so you'd get the benefit, in other words. Yeah, but unfortunately, uh, we I'm not allowed to get it because uh, the NHS in England often will not pay for me to have it. So what does it cost? Uh, uh, it would cost about five thousand pounds a year. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm allowed. I'm offered a drug that costs twenty one thousand pounds a year and could put me into a coma, which I'll never wake up from. But the cannabis tincture is too expensive, so I can't have it. So I'm that, therefore forced to break the law and be criminalised. How much do you worry about the knock on the door? I mean, you talked about you know being in the street and seeing mm. police officers and and wondering about your your fate well I'd like, it's not just a knock on the door is it it's a it's a baton through the door your door's off its hinges there's shouting there's screaming there's your handcuffed you're pushed down and you're you know you're i don't even know the word but it, it's wrong that that it, that's a massive worry like you know i i have a, as i said i have ms i'm quite a frail person i've not got much to 
uh, hold off against. So if someone's doing that to me, that's going to really, really affect my pain levels. That's going to really um, ruin my life, really. So yeah, I do, I do worry about it. But at the same time, I have to be outspoken about this because it's the right thing to do. And it is a risk. And I know it's a risk, right? But if it can help me, who else can it help? One man's experienced 29-year-old Clark French 